In this chapter, we're going to look at properties of solutions. So it's kind of divided into three sections. The first one, um, we're going to learn just some background information about how to make a solution. The second section um, is going to talk about concentration units. And then the third section, we will apply those concentration units to discuss colligative properties. So the, what, is, what is a solution? A solution is just a homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. There's two parts of the solution. You have a solute and a solvent. The solute is the one you have less of, and the solvent is the one you have more of. So if you took salt and you were dissolving it in water and you made a salt solution, the salt would be the solute and the solvent would be the water. And water is your universal solvent, so we'll see that as our solvent a lot of the times. Um, and, it, and when water is your solvent, you call that an aqueous solution. The ability of substances to form solutions really depends on two things. Um, the first one is the natural tendency for substances to mix, and that's called entropy. We'll, we'll talk about the entropy of mixing in a little bit. And the other thing, the other factor is really um, the type of intermolecular forces or intermolecular interactions that are involved. So in chapter 11 and 12, we looked a lot at uh, different types of intermolecular forces. Um, so like dispersion, London dispersion forces are present, everybody has them. Um, Nonpolar molecules, it's the only force that holds them together. So intermolecular forces are the forces holding two different molecules together. Um, so they're, they're different than intramolecular forces. That's like holding this, you know, it's the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen in this picture. That's an intramolecular force. Inter means these dotted lines here. It's what, what force is, is connecting these two molecules together. And when you uh, make a solution, you, if those are two solutes or two solvents, you have to break those apart and then you're going to form new forces. And so uh, the types of intermolecular forces are, are really important when you're making a solution. So London dispersion forces, um, nonpolar molecules have those. Everybody has those, but that's the only one that holds nonpolar molecules together. Polar molecules are held together by dipole-dipole interactions. So if you have a polar molecule, um, that's going to be the force that holds you together. A hydrogen bond is a very specific type of dipole-dipole interaction, and that happens when you have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, nitrogen, or uh, fluorine. So here in water, water, it forms hydrogen bonds um, between this ethanol, so it's the electronegative part of this guy is interacting with the um, electropositive part on the ethanol. And then you can have ion dipole interactions, and this is when you have an ionic compound and a polar molecule. Uh, you can form ion dipole interactions, so we'll talk about these in, in just a second. So three types of intermolecular interactions that are involved in a solution formation. So solution, you have two parts. You have a solute and a solvent. So you have to, um, you'll have solute-solute interactions, you'll have solvent-solvent interactions, and then you'll have solute-solvent interactions. And so when you're making a solution, you're going to have to break apart the solute particles, you're going to have to break apart the solvent um, par particles, and then when you put it all back together, you create new interactions that are the solute-solvent interactions. So if I had salt water again, um, the solute-solute interactions are going to be the interaction between the sodium and the chloride ions. Solvent solvent between water molecules and another water molecule. And then when I put all that together, you know, I'm gonna to have to rip apart the salt, I'm gonna to have to rip apart the water. And then when I put it all back together, the way the solute and the solvent interact um, is like the sodium and the, the, the water molecules or the chloride ions and the water molecules. Um, so the solute and the solute solvent interaction. So you have to break those first two and then you're gonna form the other one. And we're gonna look at the energetics on the next page. So this is just kind of like zooming in on this part of this process of solvation. Um, you start with a sodium chloride, like a salt particle, and you're surrounded by water. And now you have to break open um, some of these, so all these water molecules are interacting with each other. You're gonna separate those a little bit. You're gonna start um, solvating this uh, sodium chloride and so, and by that, you can kind of zoom in down here. Each one of those ions is going to get surrounded by water. You're going to have like a sphere of hydration around each one of those ions. Um, and that's going to go until either you run out of a solute to solvate that, or if you run out of the solute. Um, so eventually you'll reach a saturated solution. We'll talk about that on the next, in the next section. Um, so how does a solution form? Uh, just kind of just summarizing that, a solution forms the solvent, pulls apart the solute particles and surrounds them. That's called solvation, solvating them. Um, if you have an ionic compound in water, you're going to form ion dipole interactions. And in that case, you have to overcome the lattice energy. And that's the energy required to separate completely the ions in a solid ionic compound. So depending on a bunch of different factors that we learned in um, in CHEM 1, different factors affect. So things like charge and how big the molecules are, those all affect the lattice energy. Um, and you have to overcome that energy in order to solvate in an ionic compound. 
All right, so the, if the energy changes in solution, you have to separate those solute particles, you have to separate the solvent particles, and then you're going to form new solute-solvent interactions. And you can kind of look at this diagram down here. So it's going to cost you energy. This first part was the solvent. So suppose that's water and it's all stuck together. Imagine how much energy it's going to take to rip all those water molecules apart from each other. Um, and that is separating the solvents. Then you have to do the same thing for the solute. So suppose those are like your um, sodium chloride ions you're going to separate all those that costs a certain amount of energy and then when these two things interact so they're going to come you're basically going to put that whole solution back together the solution remember you have a solute and solvent in your solution um, and energy is going to be released when you do that so these two first pro pro processes are endothermic and then this last process is exothermic and then to figure out if the solution process in general is exothermic or endothermic it depends on on um, on these quantities. So how endothermic is this? How endothermic is that? How exothermic is this one? So if overall this process releases more energy than um, you had to put in, you'll get an exothermic solution process. Um, this process over here, this is endothermic. You know, it takes a lot of whatever solvent this is. It was really high, um, had a really positive um, delta H, so it's really endothermic, that's endothermic. And then when you put the solution back together, you didn't release quite as much energy. So overall, when you add these up uh, using like Hess's law, um, you get an endothermic process. So this is going to absorb heat, this is going, going to release heat, the exothermic one releases, the endothermic absorbs. Um, so you can have both when you make a solution. Sometimes they're going to give off heat and then sometimes they don't. And we're going to see that in our first lab. Um, so one of the one of the, the unknowns when you put it in when you uh, you're gonna take a solid unknown you're gonna dissolve it in water and some of them release heat some of them absorb heat so so one you're gonna feel it and it's gonna be hot that means it's uh, it's releasing heat so pay attention to that don't put that in the ice water because that's gonna melt all your all your ice but we'll we'll get back to that process so um, so why do these endothermic processes even happen right so if it, if you're saying you have to put energy in into the system in order to make it happen. Um, why, why would that even, you know, why, usually those things don't, don't occur spontaneously, except if they're accompanied by um, entropy, so by a, uh, an increase in the disorder, the randomness of the system. So entropy, in this case, is basically going to pull along one of those endothermic processes. It's going to make it happen. So, and the point of this section is really just, a, it's like a teaser for chapter um, 19 when we talk about thermodynamics, is that you can't just look at um, whether or not something is endothermic or exothermic to say whether or not the reaction is going to happen spontaneously. You have to um, take into consideration entropy as well. So entropy is a measure of disorder, randomness of your system. Um, things like to mix because it increases the entropy of the system, so that can kind of drive the reaction in the forward direction. Um, and final note there, solution formation and chemical reactions. So just because a substance disappears when it comes in contact with the solvent doesn't necessarily mean it's dissolved. Um, it could have reacted. Uh, dissolution, we're only going to be dealing with that. That would be a chemical change. So dissolution is a physical change. You can always get back to the original solute by evaporating the solvent. So we're only going to be considering physical changes, even though, you know, when you're doing chemical reactions, you, you, you could have a reaction happening and that's not a physical